A report from the national charity Prosper Canada has found that low-income Canadians are really struggling financially, this we know, but in part because of access. They've such a hard time getting access to the financial help that they need and that would make a real difference for them. This report is called Missing for Those Who Need It Most, Canada's Financial Help Gap. And we're going to talk about the findings and um, some of the ways that Canadians can address these issues with Liz Mulholland. She is the CEO of Prosper Canada. Hello there. Hey, Bruce. How are you? I'm good. I want to start off by framing who we're talking about when we're talking about low-income Canadians. Paint us a picture of the income level and the circumstances that um, folks would find themselves in. Yeah, so um, the, the statistics that we quote from are from a national survey by the Financial Resilience Institute, and they defined lower income as uh, any individual or household with an income under 20,000 and multi-person households with an income under 50,000. So you're basically talking, if you've got more than one person in the household, income up to $49,999. Mm. Um, if you're just a lone person, single individual, uh, income under 20,000. And having an income level, uh, having income at that level in today's mm -hmm. times of nuts inflation and mm -hmm. crazy cost of everything would be a hurdle uh, first and foremost. But there are also, and as this report uh, highlights, a number of other barriers. Can you talk about some of the barriers that people sure. at that income level would, would experience? Sure. Um, you know, they have very distinct financial contacts and needs that are different from middle and higher income people. So um, when your income is at that level, the odds are a good chunk of your income comes from government benefit programs, tax credits. So think of Canada Child Benefit or Old Age Security and Guaranteed Income Supplement if you're a senior, um, GST credit, Canada Worker Benefit if you're a younger working person who's getting some income support. So... Um, uh, and that means that all of those programs come with rules and restrictions and thresholds, et cetera, and interactions that are quite complex to sort through and to navigate. And, um, and they also need to be applied for. You need to tax file to get that income support. So, so they have a lot of needs around this benefit system uh, and navigating it safely, effectively, successfully to uh, get their incomes up. And, but they also have to navigate the rules about, well, if you save too much money and your assets are too high, you lose access to that program or suddenly you no longer get the housing subsidy or the childcare subsidy comes with that. So um, they're also, uh, it has implications for what kind of savings vehicles they use for saving for retirement. So if your income is under 50,000, you should be saving in a tax-free savings account. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, when you retire, you're going to see all your seniors' benefits get clawed back, uh, and you'll end up getting taxed much more heavily. So, uh, uh, but often uh, when people go to the bank, their bank suggests to them it's RSP season; it's time for right. you to open an RSP, and they'll say, "No, no, I want a tax-free savings account." And the 26-year-old at the bank doesn't realize that this is actually an RSP is a very bad thing for this mm. person because of their income. They say, "No, no, madam, RSPs are where it's at. Let me sell you one." And mm. Off they go to the races, they come out of the bank with an RSP and they're in the wrong savings vehicle. So, so we have this disconnect between having distinct financial circumstances and needs that really impact their ability to find relevant financial help by people who are knowledgeable about what they need and mainstream financial information, advice, guidance, and you know, stuff that's being sold to them that uh, is designed for people who have very different needs, um, but the, often the people kind of promoting it aren't aware that this isn't right for these people. You shouldn't actually be doing this. Um, and and when they go to look for something that meets their needs better, they find there's very little on offer. Um, mm. So, uh, and when we look at the private sector, which delivers many excellent financial help services for people with middle and higher incomes, um, they have very, there's no real strong business case, you know, from a commercial sense to yeah. actually design products and services for lower income consumers, because there are very few profit making opportunities or 
to the extent they exist, are much smaller than the opportunities associated with higher yeah. income clients. So, and they they inherently need to be low touch because the yeah. profit margin per human is probably a lot lower, and so yeah. that may maybe a digital intervention is yeah. the only thing that would make sense. But given the complexity that you've highlighted, harder for a for a human to take advantage of. There's yeah. one other quite intangible dynamic that you highlight in the report that I think is really relevant. And that is a lack of trust. Yeah. Why would that be? Why is that different for people with lower income than for people with higher incomes? Yeah, I think one is that disconnect around, do they really understand me and what I need? Um, and secondly, I think many people who are marginalized in our society have had experiences um, that are less than positive, I think, mm -hmm. in their interactions with mainstream institutions and, uh, and others. And so um, it might be because uh, they have a visible disability. And, you know, if you're a frontline service provider in a commercial banking establishment or financial health service, you know, you, you have targets and you've got to like move stuff through and you, you see a, a prospective client approaching who's going to take longer to serve because they have a disability or a language barrier or they're very elderly. Um, you know, the, and we've had people tell us the instinct is to duck and hope they go to the other wicket, you know, mm -hmm. like, so, um, and then we've heard from people who, you know, maybe they're sleeping rough or maybe, and so they, they don't look very nice or their clothes may be very dirty um, because they, they don't have secure housing um, or maybe they have a mental health problem. And they go in and the security guard takes one look and just cuts them off before they even get to the, the service mm -hmm. personnel and ushers them out the door. And then other people have had people make judgments and, and comments to them about, you know, well, it must be nice to sit at home and earn a welfare check every week, you know, while the rest of us have to go to work every day, you know, yeah. these types of things. So, and, and then, of course, if you're racialized or indigenous, um, you know, we have, you know, everyday racism and attitudes that aren't what they should be that people experience. And the double whammy is really for people who are both low income and racialized. They've told us that their experiences are often um, can be negative, not not across the board, of course not. Yeah. But um, but the risk is higher that they will have had a bad experience that that leads them and they and they report that they're less likely to then talk to these mainstream institutions as a result. So you, you outline eight critical services for financial health and, and I eyeball that list and some of them I can see for higher income. Sure, a client is reasonably well served by a bank, but as we say, lower profit for someone who's lower income. These are things yeah. like conducting a comprehensive financial health assessment, helping mm -hmm. to build a comprehensive financial plan, helping mm -hmm. to develop and adhere to a, mm -hmm. a budget mm -hmm. uh, and spending plan. Mm -hmm. What are the ways to provide those services for this mm -hmm. population? Yeah, I think we've seen that um, you know, we've run large scale pilots across the country of community based service providers that work with low income people every day who've been trained to provide these financial help services. Um, uh, and those have been very successful. Uh, we found out from third party evaluations and, and the, the sites we ran in Ontario that, you know, over 80% of the people who use the service had received no financial help from any other source in the past year. Um, they, uh, if they access tax filing and benefit help, their incomes went up by quite a bit on average about $3,600. Um, and that they, uh, they were achieving a financial outcome as a result of the service, even from very brief interactions. So, mm -hmm. and over 95% would recommend the service to somebody else. So that tells us that the services were working, that they're needed, that they're relevant. Um, uh, I think we have other, um, uh, you know, uh, CRA supports a national network of community tax clinics, which yeah. do great work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we know CPA Canada and, and accountants have their, their tax clinics too. Um, and these things are phenomenal. The problem is they only operate during the tax season. Yeah. And if somebody is eligible for another $10,000 a year in income, if they can tax file, but there's no help on offer the rest of the year, do we really want them to wait a whole year? So I think some of these are, can we, extend some of these services year round that are, are so good during the tax season. So, 
And then, of course, for debt help, we have great nonprofit credit counseling services, but yeah. probably not adequately supported. Yeah. You know, so um, so we need more of that service. Um, and then we need ways to connect these services out and extend them out to rural, remote, and indigenous communities who are often quite cut off from these services. Mm. You can find them in urban areas, but we're not finding, not all of them, but you're more likely if they exist to find them in an urban area. So how do we build relationships, leverage technology, build partnerships to really make mm. sure that no matter where you live in Canada, you can connect into these services? If I could snap my fingers, one of the things that I would do for this, uh, for this population mm -hmm. is, um, have these kinds of services available automatically, i.e. you don't have to be aware of them, you don't have to sign up for them, you don't have mm -hmm. to show up for them, mm -hmm. they're just there. And a great example in nonprofit credit counseling is uh, a collection agency actually will do a warm referral to a nonprofit credit counselor. Mm -hmm. They're talking to a client on the phone, they will mm -hmm. literally patch mm -hmm. them through to a nonprofit mm -hmm. credit counselor. What are the opportunities for the services to exist like you would expect in a hospital if you've had a car accident? Yeah. You don't have to then go and apply to get someone to search your, yeah. your head back together. You're, you're yeah. there, you're presenting with this injury and you kind of can just be in the flow of how that um, system unfolds. You know what, that's a great question, Bruce. And I would say we already know that there are two questions that any service system could ask people and they would know whether they needed financial help or not. The two questions are, have you tax filed in the past year if they're low income? Um, and if you haven't, well, madam, can I connect you to a free community tax clinic service that can assist you because it's likely you're not getting all the income that's available to you. Um, the other question is, are you having trouble making ends meet at the end of the month? And if the answer is yes, well, you know, we can probably help with that. Would you like to meet with a financial counselor? Toronto Public Library offers free financial counseling two branches. Can we make an appointment for you? You know, like, so I think in almost any human service system, you could build this into the intake system, but they need to have the relationships with community financial health providers, whether it's the free tax clinic, the credit counseling, the financial counseling service. And the problem right now is we don't have enough coverage or investment in those free financial help services to be able to refer people out to. But I know in Winnipeg, where they do have a great community financial help organization, Seed Winnipeg and community financial counseling services working together, they've reached out to tens of organizations and municipal mm -hmm. service providers, and they've uh, taught them how to build these screening questions in, and they've built referral relationships. And so right. pretty much if you live in Winnipeg and you're low income, if you walk in to get a service anywhere, somebody's going to ask you, have you tax filed lately? And right. are you having trouble making ends meet? Don't go gonna anywhere. We're going to tax file right yeah. now. <laughs> well, in Edmonton, they'll actually refer you to somebody on the spot who can help you with right. your finances if you go to get your free transit pass right. or your um, free recreation pass as a low income person. So let's get to that everywhere. Liz, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Bruce. It's been a pleasure as it. always. Liz Mulholland is the CEO of Prosper Canada. And this report is called Missing for Those Who Need It Most, Canada's Financial Help Gap. There is much to be done, but there are lots of people like Liz who are working on this and, and working to improve things every day, everywhere.